Well, in order to work with vector functions, we're going to have to know a few things. We have to convince ourselves vector functions follow the same rules of functions as normal functions. They're functions. Vector functions have domain, they have range, they have limitations in the form of their limits. We have to look at their continuity. All of these things will allow us to eventually apply calculus to vector functions. So to warm up, let's do an example in which we have to find the domain of this vector function. The vector function is given by the position vector r is equal to 1 over t minus 1 for the x component, natural log of t for the y component, square root of t, square root of t for the z component. Notice that this vector function is a parametric function. The parameter is t. The dependent variables are the x, y, and z components. So the x component is a function of t, and that's given by 1 over t minus 1. The y component is a function of t as well. That's given as the natural log of t. And the z component is a function of t given by the square root of t. Our goal is to find the domain of this vector function. So the domain is going to be the set of all points such that each of these functions are defined. So the domain of one function, let's say the x component, will be different than the domain of the y component, which is a natural log of t, which may be different than the domain of the z component, which is the square root of t. So each of those domains may be different. We have to take the we have to take that into account to come up with the overall domain because our vector function can only exist if each of its components exists. So to find the domain, let's find the domain of each one of these. Let's begin with the x component. So again, the x component is given to us as 1 over t minus 1. Can you tell me the domain of this function? In other words, what values of t are possible in order for this function to be defined? Well, how we find a domain of, of functions in which we have a fraction, and in this case we have a fraction, how to find this domain is we're going to see that the denominator cannot be equal to zero. Cannot be zero. Because if we have a zero in the denominator, that would make this function undefined. So whenever you have a fraction, look at the points in which the denominator is 0. So that would be t minus 1. We would solve this for when the denominator can't be 0. So I'm going to just put the does not equal symbol. And now we just solve this for t. We get the t cannot be equal to 1, which means for the x component, we could have all values of t as long as t doesn't equal to 1. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a number line. This number line is going to represent increasing values of t. Here is t equals 0 on our number line. Here is t equals 1 on our number line. And I'll just do some other values in the positive t direction and a couple of values in the negative t direction. So for our first problem, for the x component, we know that 
t cannot be equal to 1. So I'll signify that with an open circle above 1. And this right here is just representing that t can take on any value except for t equals to 1. Now let's look at the z component. Or rather, let's, let's go in order instead. Let's look at the y component. The y component is given as natural log of t. My question for you, what is the domain of the natural log of t? Well, if you said values of t such that t is greater than zero, you'd be absolutely right. Because remember, for natural logs, natural logs of some argument, a, a has to be a value greater than zero in order for that natural log to be defined. So in this case, we're going to have t has to be a value greater than zero. Let's add this to our graph, to our number line. So I'm going to go to our number line. I'm going to do this in a different color. Let's do it in green. So in our number line, we know that t can be a value greater than zero, but not including zero. So this represents the number line for natural log of t. And let me label the one for 1 over t minus 1. Notice the natural log of t has a more restricted domain than 1 over t minus 1. And now let's do the z component. The z component is equal to the square root of t. What values of t would this square root of t be defined? Well, remember, whenever you have a square root, square roots are only defined for values of the argument so we will say just the argument of the square root um, for values of the argument greater than or equal to zero in order for the square root to be defined on the real number line. So this means t must be values greater than or equal to zero. Let's put that in our number line. So that's very similar to the, um, to the y component. I'll just put it here. Since we can include values of 0, I'll just shade that in. And t includes values greater than or equal to 0. OK, so now we have enough information to determine the domain of our function. So I'm going to go ahead and just recopy our number line just so we have a little bit more space to work with. So we have our number line. We have to determine the domain of our function, of our vector function. Why I like to do a number line is it helps me visualize what's possible and what's not possible in regards to domain. Basically, any region on this number line where all three functions exist will be the domain of our vector function. So I see all three functions exist in this range right here. This is the range of t between 0 and 1. 
it doesn't include 0 because our natural log of t isn't defined for 0. And it doesn't include 1 because our square root Rather, it doesn't include 1 because the fraction 1 over t minus 1 is undefined for when t equals 1. So part of our domain is from 0 to 1, not including 0 or 1. Another way of writing this would be an interval notation. You could just write it as 0 to 1. The other part of our domain goes from 1 to positive infinity. Well, we could write that as t takes on values greater than 1. Another way of writing that in interval notation would be from 1 to infinity. So for the domain of our vector function, we would have the set of all t such that t is greater than 1, or 0 is less than t is less than 1. Another way of expressing this is expressing it in interval notation as 0 to 1 union with 1 to infinity for the domain of our vector-valued function.